Uh, so we are between you and drink, so we'll keep it uh, punchy. Um, we have a small select group uh, up here today. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to, as we move through, um, we'll, we'll end up sharing our perspectives on, on what the topic is, which is uh, supply chain development in Asia, managing opportunities and challenges. We'll each give our own perspectives, but then uh, um, also move through a Q&A as we, we, as we go through as well. So please uh, be prepared to uh, ask some questions to the panel. Um, who I'll take you through and introduce you to them, in fact, now. Uh, so three people we have up here. Uh, to my left is Duval Bush, who is the, uh, a Senior Vice President for Supply Chain at Unilever. And uh, just some background on Duval. He joined Hindustan Lever in uh, 1984 as a management uh, trainee and has since held a series of assignments in manufacturing uh, household care category and new ventures, including a stint with Unilever in the, in the UK. Uh, in June around 2005, he was appointed as Vice President uh, and subsequently appointed to Executive Director Supply Chain and ultimately elevated to the Board of Directors at Hindustan Lever. Uh, and according to the Economic Times, which I was able to look at through the internet, he's uh, snapped up by Unilever, the parent company that is, um, to learn from the, his insights around emerging markets and emerging economies and trying to deploy that to, uh, to other points in the world. Uh, and is now the senior VP at Unilever, part of the, the core global supply chain leadership team. It's a very experienced. To uh, Deval's left is Troy. Let me just get the information. So Troy Shortle is uh, the senior vice president for Harvey in Asia Pacific. Um, Troy's had a 20-year career uh, through DHL, Toll, and now with Harvey. Uh, he's worked uh, in, with most Fortune uh, Global 100 companies to overcome supply chain challenges in, in the complex Asian market. He's ex extensive experience in freight forwarding and logistics management, uh, operations, and also strategy. He's a specialist in China and, interestingly, speaks Mandarin. Uh, he's also a frequent speaker on food safety and sustainability topics in the industry, very passionate about it from an earlier conversation I had with him. Uh, if you don't know Harvey, um, private company, large company, uh, is, it's Asia's leading cold chain and food safety solutions provider, operating 21 distribution centres in 10 countries, serving more than 7,000 restaurants for McDonald's and Subway every day. So you do know the company. Uh, last but certainly not least, Lucy Lay, uh, VP and Head of Business Development and Regional Key Account Management with Lian Fung. Uh, Lucy is Belgian Chinese <laughs> uh, and she returned to China in 2001 to lead Lian Fung's Logistics Greater China Supply Chain Solutions Team and recently has, has been promoted to the Head of Group Business Development Team. Uh, before Lian Fung, Lucy was the Asia-Pacific Regional Head for Hotel Logistics and Aerospace Logistics for Kern and Nagel, uh, and created several multi-million dollar business units from Greenfields for the group. Lucy is also the President of the Expat Women's uh, Society in China since 2012 and holds uh, an MBA degree, a Master's in International Economic Law, a Bachelor in Engineering, and is a certified professional logistician and advanced supply chain management degree. And in between that, she also works. <laughs> so Lucy's also been a, a regular speaker, panelist in, in China and, and Singapore, and is also a visiting professor at Dalian Maritime University in China. She's lived and worked in Belgium, Hong Kong, Mexico, Australia, Singapore, before now returning to China, where she, she's currently based. Um, and if, uh, if you are a real supplier, China, you certainly know of Lian Fong. Uh, Lian Fung is the world leader in consumer goods supply chain management, over 300 offices and DCs in more than 40 economies, 30,000 employees, uh, and a sourcing network of over 15,000 suppliers. Uh, Lian Fung Logistics is operated under Lian Fung, the group, and manages around 10 million square feet uh, facilities, partnering with 400 uh, renowned companies to deliver more than 100 million consumer goods, 100 million consumer goods each day. Uh, so very experienced panellists. Who am I? Um, my name is Craig Rawlings. I, I work in management consulting with Accenture. I lead what we call the supply chain operations practice uh, across ASEAN. 
Uh, so I get to work with organizations across industry, um, from telcos through to uh, resources industries, financial services, consumer products. Um, and I guess through that, I get to see and, and to understand some of the challenges that a lot of large organizations in this part of the world are actually facing. And hopefully I can share some of those with you. So the format, I guess a little bit of a different format um, to just break it up a bit during your afternoon, late in the afternoon, is that what I'd like to do is just to invite each of the speakers to give us around five minutes, their perspective on the topics of the opportunities and challenges of supply chain in this part of the world. Uh, once we get through that and get those perspectives, uh, then I'll, I'll try and be Paul and, uh, and pose some questions to the panelists to get some, uh, some discussion happening, some information sharing. And then, uh, you know, around 40 minutes or so into the, into, the, uh, into the session is to open it up to the group, right? And so please, um, you've heard the, the backgrounds of the individuals up the front here, extremely experienced, very knowledgeable, uh, and more than happy to share whatever insights they can uh, to support, to, to help you. Um, so please prepare some questions and uh, we'll, we'll spend the last part of the session uh, doing a, a QA with the, the broader group. Before I, uh, I know I've done a lot of talking, and I'll finish up shortly. Um, before I, I hand across to Deval to, to give us his perspective on supply chain, I thought I'd just spend a few moments giving at least Accenture's perspective from, from the perspective of, uh, of a consulting side of thing rather than an industry of what we see around the opportunities and challenges in this region. And I, I guess what struck me by the topic is in the same sentence we use oppor opportunities and challenges. And to me, that sums up some of the challenges we have within supply chain. Uh, ASEAN, uh, Asia Pacific offers tremendous growth potential. Uh, but with that growth potential comes a whole heap of risks. Um, and if I think of, um, of, of APAC, in fact, we talk about it as one region. It is not one region. It's a series of economies with specific needs and requirements which are actually interconnected. And, and to think of it as a single region requiring a single solution is actually part of the challenge that we as practitioners actually have. Uh, when I think of supply chain, and I've, I did my undergrad in supply chain before they actually knew how to call it supply chain, it was called transport economics. Uh, but all through my career, it's been about optimization. Right? And at first we dealt with the unpredictability of our colleagues within functions. You know, so the, uh, the demand plan that never quite matched what customers wanted, it was always a reflection of a, a sales plan. So we worked through that and we improved our forecasting and analytics. We in implemented SNOP processes and we got predictability in our supply chains. And with that predictability, we started to test new opportunities. We started to extend our global supply chains. We moved manufacturing. We built uh, global scale manufacturing centers. We, um, uh, you know, we looked for countries where we could get some labor arbitrage. We leveraged our supply base in, in order to reduce our cost. Uh, we implemented lean uh, six, sigma, six Sigma type of processes and we took inventory out. But that added risk. And when we take the models which work in mature markets and start to apply them in emerging markets is I think where our big challenges actually come from. Um, what we've seen, uh, I, I guess, some changes which have happened recently. Uh, Asia used to be seen as a source of product. The product moved from east to west to serve mature markets. Manufactured here, delivered overseas. Actually, we're now seeing a shift in trade flows. We're seeing product actually go from west to east. And we're seeing significantly more intra-Asia trade occurring. You know, the tech-savvy individuals that uh, live in, in Mumbai have probably more in common with their, their peers in San Francisco than they do with the, you know, their rural uh, compatriots in India. You know, same with the rich in Shanghai. They have more in common about their, their taste for uh, um, label products as they do with the set in Paris. Yet, amongst all of that, we also have day workers who can only uh, afford to wash their hair that night uh, and buy satchels of product if they actually work that day. So Asia, in a sense, is a hugely complex market, um, not just on, on a product sense, 
but in many other sense. And, and that, um, that creates a lot of complexity uh, and challenge for, logis uh, for supply chainers. Um, if we look at the tsunami, I mean, one of the, the more recent occurrences around the tsunami and the earthquake and the floods was that it actually exposed supply chains to risk. Uh, those organisations that were better able to manage that risk actually took competitive advantage. So when you, we start to consider how to design supply chains, it's all about managing risk in that supply chain so you can take a competitive advantage should that risk event occur. So risk is not a quarterly annual or annual event which needs to occur, risk management planning. It becomes a day-to-day -day plan. And that's done through the design of the operating model for the supply chain. Um, just, uh, just some, some stats to reinforce the whole issue of complexity. Um, enabling trade index, which is, is, which is a view uh, across 132 different countries. Singapore came out as number one, Hong Kong number two, China was number 56 in the enabling trade. Uh, Indonesia was 58 and in India, 100 out of 132. Um, so you, just the, the nature of the markets, uh, how trade flows to those markets are very dif are different and unpredictable and can't be seen as the same. Um, if you look at even the basic components, getting a container through the port of Singapore, uh, I think the dwell time is around two days. If you go to Jakarta, it's around eight days. Right? And if you've seen the congestion, which is around uh, the port in Jakarta, you start to appreciate you know, some of the infrastructure challenges that are there. So a, a key, if, if I can leave you with a, a key thought, a key message, is that we, as, lo as supply chainers, I guess we think about um, our work as, as, a, as a chain, a series of interlinked events. But I think that thinking has now kind of moved on because I think Asia actually poses a whole different set of challenges. Asia is a discrete set of markets. It has infrastructure, tax issues, political issues which must be dealt with on a local level. Now what does that mean for us? The more, the more um, progressive organisations are actually rethinking their supply chains and moving from a supply chain to, if you like, more of a supply web and starts to consider what do I need to bring into the centre and what do I need to actually deploy out? So the idea of um, my infrastructure investment decisions, where am I going to deploy my assets to, what type of assets am I going to have in different locations, is now moving more back to the centre rather than being delegated to individual countries. Decisions on planning, on forecasting, uh, even, even regional replenishment decisions happens at a central level um, mainly because of talent issues, right, and the need to deal with a complex array of questions around optimising supply chains which can only be done at a centre. So we've seen procurement centralised for a long period of time, but now we're seeing strategy and planning and logistics now being brought more to the centre for organisations, but also recognising that you still need to have local uh, on, on the street capability in country to be able to deal with the you know, relatively high touch environment, uh, understanding the infrastructure issues, um, any, any political issues which are going to, to change configuration of supply chains, you know, market information. So the, the people on the ground tend to deal with that, but companies are moving a lot of the, the, the high thinking, if you like, back into more of a centralised group. So just some, okay, just that's it from me. So from key points, I think an important point is a lot of what we learn, you know, there's Gatorna's book over here, so a lot of what we learn actually has to be unlearned. Sometimes it's better to keep more inventory than less inventory. Sometimes it's better to have more touch around product than uh, trying to reduce the number of times we handle product. You know, and sometimes it's, it's needed to sub-optimise a supply chain in order to be more effective for customers. Well. Thanks, Greg. Um, <clears throat> so where we sit, I'm going to try and give a slightly different point of view. Uh, a, a much more, uh, shall I say, a, let's just step back for a minute because, you know, if you read the papers or see television or, or, or Google or whatever it is, there, there's doom and gloom. There's currency, there is, uh, there, is, there is crisis, there is political and social upheaval, etc., etc. And I think at such a time, one just needs to step back and say, so are we following the wrong trend? And let me give you some facts and figures. 
because I believe and we believe that actually it's those that matter rather than the short term what's going on. So the two sets of numbers between 2010 and 2020, the DNE world, the developing and emerging markets, which for us is Asia, Africa, everything apart from Western Europe and Northern America, so that keep it simple. Uh, in population terms, will grow from today's 84% of the world's population to 95% of the world's population. We're talking of 6.4 billion people from today, at, today meaning 2010, 5.8 to about 6.5 billion people. So the population is here. 13 out of 1,500 million plus countries are in DNE, or will be in DNE by 2020. Of these 13, 11 will be in Asia. In 2010, 45% of the consumer spending, roughly 19 trillion US dollars, was in DNE. In 2020, it will be 55% at almost double, which is 36 trillion dollars. Okay. So if you were in our industry or actually in any industry which are serving consumers and customers, you would ask two questions. Is my business where the people are? And is my business where the money is? And frankly, if you actually look at this kind of spread, this trend isn't changing because of the kind of events that are happening today. These are global shifts. These are tectonic shifts. They're on their way. Things are not going to change very much. Near our home, if you take Asia, Asia in 2020 will be 52% of the world's population and 30% of this consumer spending. This is the center of the world. So I just want to focus us, us to say this is really the place where it's happening and will continue to happen for as far possible as we can see. Right? If you then take supply chain and try and, you know, there's a lot of stuff. There's, there's always a problem of plenty because when you are seeing these major shifts, Frankly, it's difficult to pick and choose and say, how are you going to win? Because you can do almost anything and hopefully get a little bit of success and a little bit of time, and then, you, then we all tend to lose our way. And we believe, and I, I believe in quite passionately, there are, in our view, five things. First is the challenge and the tension of global scale and local agility, the point that Craig made. There is to be a very high touch at the front end, at the consumer and customer end. But at the end of the day, the best of the world has to arrive in every market, in every street, in every shop, in every consumer's home. That is supply chain's first challenge and the first competitive advantage if it delivers it. The second one is partnering. Now, it's often spoken, but the reality is because there is so much to do in these environments in these countries and in, in all our all, all the DNA markets essentially everything has to be developed at the same time there is no time to wait for suppliers to develop there is no time for customers to set up uh, outlets there's no time for research and development facilities to be set up and therefore products which are developed specifically for DNA markets come into being there's no time to set this up in the way it has traditionally been set up and therefore partnering to win is critical that's point number two the third point is, is really about speed. Because actually, the numbers I'm telling you are in the public domain. I wouldn't be allowed to tell them to you if they were not. So honestly, this is not something new or surprising. Everybody has these numbers. Everybody sees these opportunities. Everybody is here to play. And everybody is good. So the one who comes first wins. Wins bigger, let's put it that way. And therefore, speed is critical. Speed is money. Speed is success. Speed is pretty much business. Speed is size. Enablers to that are two more. Sustainability. Now, again, you know, this is a very often used word, overused. Uh, everybody knows sustainability. It's something you throw in conferences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the, the thing is, how is sustainability experienced in this part of the world? It's experienced that I do not have clean drinking water. It's experienced as I cannot go to my work to work in a factory in a shift, in the first shift, because that's the only 45 minutes that water comes in my home and I need to fill it up for my kids and my family. Sustainability emerges as the enormous amounts of garbage heaps that are around my house 
which give my children illness. This is how sustainability manifests itself. And I think we as supply chain have a responsibility. In fact, we probably only have a license to survive and manage this only if we, if we handle this very, very carefully and very, very sensitively. And last but not the least is talent. And if you can see, I've actually picked everything that, that, that I guess everybody knows. The question is, how do you then spin it to make sure that you win in the DNA? Talent is essentially local. The, the, the tension of local agility can be created along with global scale when global talent meets local talent on a daily, monthly, annual basis to manage this complexity that we call the DNA world. To land the best of global scale into every market can only happen if local talent is just as good, just as powerful, just as big, just as capable as the best of the global talent. And that cannot be done globally. That has to be done in every individual market by winning the hearts and minds of people who live in those markets. So the five things, global scale local agility, partnering to win, speed, sustainability, and talent. In our view, in my view, I believe passionately, these are the elements of competitive advantage for supply chain. Thank you. Craig, do we want to pause for some questions now, or should we just jump, jump into it? Yeah. Thanks, Duval. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Paul Lim and the organizers for inviting me here today and uh, give you a little picture of, of Javi and the, what it really is an exciting time to be managing uh, supply chains for quick serve restaurants in Asia. McDonald's and Subway open up a new store every day. And despite a difficult year, Yum! still manages to pull down over 50% of their global income from China. As an indication of business maturity and the successful strategies in core cities, leading quick serve restaurants are shifting their growth ambitions to Asia's fastest growing and underserved markets. It's a theme that we've heard quite a lot today. How do you capture growth and how do you do it quickly? But reaching beyond your core, beyond the core cities of Asia, where profitable businesses has, have been built, and more importantly, supply chains have been designed, and generating acceptable returns is proving to be extremely difficult for most. I think Unilever, a lot of experience in this area, and Liam Fung as well. Challenges beyond, when you reach beyond the core market include uh, supply chain costs that outpace your sales, Ensuring, in our case, what's particularly important, product integrity, particularly when product is going into the mouths of millions of consumers every day. And finding alternatives to a one-size-fits-all approach in diverse, fast-growing markets. The first element that I want to spend some time on is the cost outpacing sales. And many of you here today spend a lot of time in the fastest developing markets around Asia, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, Thailand, parts of China. And you see this as well. Reaching target consumers beyond Metro Manila uh, into the provinces beyond the south and the eastern coast of China, any island off of Java and Indonesia, requires strategies that deploy multiple modes of transportation, and also a very strong control over your costs and planning. In fact, operating margins are frequently squeezed to the limit just trying to supply new products to new stores from the old locations that were serving your core cities. And as an added drag, particularly in the quick serve restaurant industry, a new store takes between 12 and 18 months to start contributing to the bottom line, to the business. So you've got an added drag of actually opening up new stores that are not net contributors for a better part of a, of a fiscal year. So what's working for Javi? What's working for the customers that we serve? Um, and I think you know, it's no surprise that, and it's been mentioned already today, uh, that taking a collaborative approach, and for us that means a system-wide approach. In, in many cases, McDonald's and Subway are in a very unique position in the industry because they have suppliers that have served them in the United States, Europe and other locations that they've invited to come in and actually set up supply chain production, sorry, product production in Asia, in those developing markets. And they're asking them to go further now uh, today. Um, so what we do with them is that we, uh, when we think about the future 
network to serve the fastest growing markets around Asia, going beyond just the core uh, that's been catered for uh, up until this point and, and thinking much further out into the future about where bets will be placed for uh, capacity and also capability. Um, we're not looking just at the, the classical uh, outbound piece from DC to consumption point in, in a restaurant. We're actually looking at the inbound piece, which in most instances, particularly for the fastest uh, growing peripheral markets in Asia, is more than 40% of the total supply chain cost. Uh, we're also looking at sites themselves and thinking about uh, what we call hubs or food towns. So if you will, uh, in, in China, for example, and, and soon come to the Philippines, a distribution center with a, a protein factory, a bakery, a dairy, all with, within a campus type environment and being able to leverage not just uh, you know, labor efficiencies and, but also cutting out the primary move uh, you know, for, for a, a lot of the semi-finished goods coming into that uh, finished goods warehouse. And also on the sustainability side, being able to get real step change from, uh, from uh, energy efficiency on, on a site. So, if you're looking for uh, you know, insights and you're looking for what's new, particularly to serve the, uh, the peripheral markets outside of traditional core, that's where we start to look for insight. Uh, we feel that uh, you know, from the producers that have been serving uh, you know, our customers in the past, it's all about putting up the future, thinking much longer term, going from typically two to three year planning horizons out to in some cases 15 years or beyond in terms of capacity and capabilities. The second area that I'd like to talk about is product integrity. And Gartner, uh, the PR firm, uh, has estimated that the brand value of our largest customer, McDonald's, in, in 2012 was 95 billion US dollars. And when you get brand equity like that, uh, and you balance that with growth in some difficult to serve markets, in fact, markets that uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of supply chain services, you know, they're, they're elements that you wouldn't want to trust with food products. But thankfully, today, across the 7,000 or so outlets that we serve uh, for McDonald's and Subway, no one's uh, ever died eating uh, at, at one of these outlets, and we'd like to keep it that way. So would, so would our customers, of course, and protect not just the, the 95 billion, but, but of course what it means to consumers every day. So we've built uh, really a reputation uh, with our customers as being a, a name you can trust, maybe not a name you've heard of, Javi, but a name you can trust in, in places that you cannot. Uh, going to very far away locations, as I said, multiple modes, very difficult touch points. Um, for our operations, and again, no surprise, many of you follow the HACCP standard uh, for uh, food, food and uh, safety handling. Um, but we also have inter introduced a regional quality team that actually goes into each of the uh, markets in Asia and works with government inspectors. So actually going in and not just lobbying, but actually training up hygiene inspectors in a number of countries, particularly those in emerging Asia, uh, about what uh, food quality is all about. Um, and when you deliver to the scale that we deliver to, almost 45 million cases uh, into 7,000 outlets, uh, uh, on a monthly basis, a monthly basis, technology can only get you so far. The tracking and tracing capability, either in a truck or on a container for temperature control, uh, GPS tracking to make sure you know that your driver is not stopping somewhere and going, you know, put the potential for, uh, you know, some kind of interference in in a load. Um, we go beyond that, uh, and actually we bring what I think, you, if you read John Gatorna's book, it's all about people. It's bringing people back into the analysis of the supply chain. So. What we like to think about is that we bring, we drive a, a quality culture with our people. And you can't just rely on the technology, um, even to the point of, of uh, calibration of temperature control devices or the testing that needs to go on on so many touch points along the supply chain. Uh, so we're really relying on our people to deliver the promise of food safety across this vast geography. And, Look, that's, I guess, again, probably not a surprise to you, but when you do it day in, day out, it does take a lot, and it really, it really demands a quality culture, both at the oper operational level, but also at the leadership level. 
Um, I think I'm going to leave it there because we've asked to talk about five minutes. And, but there are some other areas uh, that we can talk about in terms of, uh, you know, in the question and answer around where do you find innovation and uh, what, what does that look like today? Because I think many of us in the room today have been to, been to KL, you've been to Bangkok, you've been to, to Metro Manila. But what, what, is, what is the face of some of the, the particularly the quick serve restaurants, uh, what is it looking like out there in, in Medan or Bali Pak Pan or Davao? Uh, what are, what's happening? And where, where, and by the way, maybe the rents are even more dear than they are here in Singapore or in Shanghai. And, and definitely going to escalate. So there's a lot of pressure in that space as well. So thank you. Lucy? Thank you. First of all, thanks uh, to Paul. And I'm back to Singapore for this event. It's always good to come back. Um, I think most of you probably have heard, uh, have seen, if you haven't read the book uh, called The World is Flat from Thomas Fieldman, you have heard about the book. So today we live in a very different world. And in the past, um, certain countries, or because of the geographic advantage or political advantage, they have the advantage towards uh, the situation. However, that advantage is slowly disappearing. Today we see the individual, country, or the region. You have to compete or with the other, it's really like you're competing in the same street. And how do you make yourself stand out? If you look into the uh, supply chain companies, there are so many in every country, in every city. So how do you make your com company stand out? So that's a big question. And competing the supply chain management in the flat world management is very different from the traditional world. In the past, we source, like everybody said, Craig also said, in the past, Asia is the sourcing countries. The cheap labor provides um, the, all the brands sourced, uh, sourcing in uh, uh, Eastern country and provide a product to the Western country. And when you do the supply chain study, that moment it was called logistic study. It was a linear comparison. You see the container rate, you ask a few companies to quote you, or you find the cheapest uh, warehouse. So that was a very lenient comparison. However, today, the norm is source everywhere, source everywhere, and sell anywhere. So if you see a pair of jeans made, for example, the pair of jeans of Tommy Hilfiger, it's in my written made in uh, Thailand. However, the fabric can come from Bangladesh, and the dyeing technique can be done in, uh, the young can come from Pakistan, and the dyeing technique can be done in Bangladesh, while the zipper and, and, and uh, buttons can come from the best manufacturer in Japan, and then assembled everything in Thailand. So it's not really made in Thailand or made in China anymore. So in this kind of situation, you still, it's a still Tommy Hilfiger's brand, and this brand in the past was sold in states and then spread to Europe. But nowadays, it's everywhere in four continents, if not five continents. So how do you manage the supply chain? So you cannot compare my freight, uh, my freight cost from, from China, uh, from Thailand to, to US, who can give me the uh, best price anymore? You can't do this linear comparison anymore. It's a, it's a dynamic, it's a multi-dimensional comparison. So like Lian Fong have 15,000 uh, manufacturers in the network. We don't own any manufacturer. We are, we brand ourselves as an orchestrator uh, of the supply chain. So all the manufacturers, they will produce between 30 to 70% output for Lian Fong. So when you, any brand, when they sold, typically for the fashion brand, now in the past you had this two seasons, now any brand minimum to have four seasons, and certain brands like Zara, every two weeks is a new, it's a new fashion comes out. And they all want to hit all four corners. Everywhere in the world, they want to hit the same fashion at the same time. So these bring a humendous complexity to your product flow, 
to the information flow, to the financial flow. So you, when, you do the, uh, when you do the supply chain management and when you do the supply chain study, you've got to consider where do I source. It's not just finding the cheapest place to do your manufacturing. When you do the sourcing, you have to compare the capacity of the, uh, of the factory, the political regime of that, uh, of that country, the facilities of that country, and then the transportation, the government policies. So, and then you do the entire comparison, find whether the transportation can support that. So the supply chain today, it's very uh, challenging. Also, the, everywhere in the world, people has a different pattern, has a different volume. So these, the, it's a permanent increase of the volatility and uncertainty. However, today, very, very few uh, supply chain companies is integrated. The customer actually need a total, uh, total supply chain, empowered integrated supply chain. Very few company is in that. So we had a problem here. However, in, as in Chinese they say, Wei Ji, when there is a problem, or there is a crisis, there is always an opportunity. So I think there is no better time for a supply chain industry for 3PL than today. When you look into the company, when you look into the company, typically they still, I think 85% of companies still source from the Asian, comp Asian countries or from uh, Turkey's, from whatever, and then bring back to their central, central headquarters, DC, and then send it out everywhere in the world. If you know there is a company still operating this way, and most of the time they are, you know they are not optimized. So here is your opportunity to go in, to be the thought leader, to plant a seed for the client, say, you are doing this for 14 years, for 15 years, which is very, very good. However, the trend is changing. So if you're still operating this way, you might lose your competitiveness. So it's your chance to bring the thought leadership to your customer. And if you are in the shipper side, as a supply chain, as a supply chain directors, it's your chance to stand out, to say, okay, now it's not incremental change anymore to improve my supply chain. Now it's a time, the time has come to call supply chain director to do a fundamental change, to completely re-engineering your supply chain. So when you took, look into when you look into the supply chain, you want to compare the knots and the lines. Where should I have my sourcing? And where should I, and you compare the, the inbound freight, and you compare the where should I do the hub? Which country give me the best opportunity to do that and the best, uh, 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 best policy to do that? And then look into how do I go from my hub into every country. So supply chain management's work is very, very, challenging now, and, but it's also very rewarding. With this thought leadership, if, if your supply chain is very fragmented, it's impossible to deliver that. So you need to have a company who stand out, really working with the clients like a partnership, like Deval said, as a partner. Um, you cannot look into every country segregated. You've got to look into the clients. Where is your five years plan? Even your 10 years plan? Where, your, where do you think your market gravity is going to shift? Then the company is going to design a supply chain for you. You cannot use an Excel sheet anymore to do that. So the technology part is very important. Like for example, uh, we use a supply chain network design uh, um, op optimization model to really take into consideration, you can have a few thousand uh, a comparison coming out. And then with your, with your technical knowledge, you know where's the constraint and you put into the consideration to define the best hub for your customers. So, and as, as everyone before me already said, people are most important. I think now all the multinational companies the, in the last three years to, they all have a, sup, uh, a supply chain a solution or call the lead logistics uh, or value chain logistics, all have these kind of functions. How do you compare, how do you, how do you decide I give business to you instead of to that company? So you still want to feel that this company of my choice, of my choice of a 3PL, 
has a passion to serve. They are a Jew. They are passionate to serve you, and they have the knowledge to understand the nitty gritty of each individual countries. If you're talking about the hub, you can have in Hong Kong, you can have in Singapore, you can have in Vietnam, you can have in China. And there are so many different policies in China supporting the hub. So, for example, you can go to the free trade zone, you can go to the bounty logistic park, you can go to the free trade port. Where do you choose? According to the different industry, you will have different choices. So we see tremendous support from the government um, involved into the, the supply chain industry. For example, the uh, China 12-year plan already put into supply chain, development of the supply chain as the country's one of the most important strategy to go on. So we see the supply chain industry has a tremendous potential uh, wise, uh, to be the thought leaders. And second, it's a total integrated, empowered supply chain. Okay, thank you. All the other will do the ans question answers. Okay. So slightly longer than five minutes, but I, I think there was some great information that was shared there. Uh, what I would like to do since we're running a little bit behind time is just to, I'll pose the first question and then I'll actually open it up to the, to the floor then to pose subsequent questions. And I think one, uh, for me, one key theme that came through from the, the three speakers is actually the, the power and the importance of creating the right partnerships. If I can uh, quote, um, Troy was talking about a name you can trust in a place you can't, right? And, and um, trying to work a cold chain through some of the new markets, I guess, is, is quite challenging. Uh, and Deval was talking also about uh, basically getting to every store, every corner store and every, every house, ultimately. And that's also through partnerships. I just like, I guess, your perspective on the importance of partnerships, how you create some of those supply chain partnerships uh, and how you manage them to manage the risk which is inherent in each of your business. So, uh, thank you. I think, uh, uh, very briefly, I think two sets of partnerships call out to us. The first is the partnership with our suppliers, our vendors. Um, and I think that is something that, again, uh, we've been doing for a long time, but really to get into long-term business planning with them is something that's important because capacities and capabilities have to be built by our suppliers quite often at a significantly higher cost and, and commitment than we have internally. So I think that's one thing that we're really now driving very hard. I think even with customers, I think what we see, particularly with global customers, is that growth is the common agenda. And very often when we, are, we have been in, such a, in a country, in a market for decades, uh, there are very unique capabilities we can bring in terms of uh, even managing a lot of the uh, back end for our customers while they are opening stores and stabilizing them. So I think this is, it's, a, it's a very dynamic nature of partnership and there is really something that you have to learn almost on a daily basis and say, and fit in the gaps. It's almost like a modern team. I mean, you know, anybody can score a goal, anybody can defend a goal. And you manage this as a team without really worrying about being too formal about it. Yeah, I think to pick up on that, I think many companies recognize that there's a need to change, that the, what, what got you to a certain point is not gonna get you much further beyond. Uh, you, you probably could be taken over or there's just that much opportunity not to excel like you have in the past. And, uh, I think the you know, companies typically uh, look inside, inside their own company. But the real opportunity is when they expand that internal look to their closer, closest providers. And that's what I talk about partnership. And that, that's coming from the brand owner, Unilever, or McDonald's, or whoever, actually articulating in a, as open as possible a way to their partners what their future is going to look like and what, 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 their, what keeps them up at night, really. And I, you know, I, I come from the third-party logistics industry. Uh, uh, Mr. Graham and I were colleagues in a, in a future life. And most companies, frankly, most brand owners, frankly, don't share a lot of that type of information with their logistics provider. That's the cold, hard, honest truth. When you get online eBids, when you get churn and burn uh, freight, you know, uh, freight rates that aren't even good for a season, uh, there's a tif difficult uh, environment to build a trusting, open, long-term type discussion relationship in. I'm not saying that that's going to go away, but that has its place, and it certainly does for a lot of you procurement 
uh, folks here in, in the room today. But we're talking about something completely different. In fact, throw all of that type of behavior out when you talk about what we're talking about here. In fact, you've got to figure out a way to incentivize your partners, 3PLs, L LLPs, all your, your uh, packaging provider, your, your core product provider, your you know, sub-assembly, whoever it is. You've got to figure out a way to share in a way with them about things in the future that you may not know about, but you've got to figure out a way for them to come to the table uh, and, and share with you and place bets uh, to support you. Um, it's the only way that we've really seen uh, it work. And that, that's difficult if there's not a culture already embedded in a, in a brand owner to share or in their leadership to, 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 to open up and talk about that. Because the fact is that a lot of companies are going to uh, fail today are the ones that are not collaborating, that are relying on kind of old networks uh, that, that may have worked in the past. Others are going to really eat their lunch, I think, in the future. So uh, collaboration is really the only way to go. I'll make a very short remark on cooperation and partnership. I think when you study the supply chain, if you want to be the thought leader, you want to ask customers to give you all the last 12 months data in order to analyze the whole entire flow. And then you can, once you have a good information, you can recommend the best solution. So that your client has to be very open to you uh, with all the information, which is confidential. Um, from the implementation point of view, we, have a, we also have a few very good examples. For example, when we signed up a, a, a long-term deal with our customer, and we guarantee certain KPIs, so that's for year one, and then for year two we say, we believe we can improve productivity, because with the labor cost that keep on going up, you don't want to increase your uh, every year 10% of your handling charge to your customer. So the only way to improve is your productivity improvement. So we typically strike uh, a deal with our clients to say, if I can improve your productivity, so you reduce your uh, cost, we do it again share. So then the end of the year, we hand a check to you as your customer, and the customer was very happy they give some of the share, some of the uh, uh, saving to us. So I think in this way, you can really partner, and each party really have the aim for the co uh, uh, common good. Okay, uh, what I'd like to do is to, to open it up. I'm sure there's some burning questions that you do have for the, for the panel. Um, so uh, if you have a question, um, please, uh, when you get the microphone, uh, just stand up if you can, say who you are and which company you come from, and then, and then your question to whichever panelist, or just pose it to the, the direct panel. So looking for the first question. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Angelica Kayser. I'm from Emerging Markets of um, Couriers and Islands, specifically Phuket Island and soon Samui, go Samui. My question is, as an expat in a, in a country where I have lived a very long time, to grow that in that community, would you recommend something like a franchise system so that I could be prepared to grow this business in outlying islands? and areas where most, the majority of companies don't reach, how do I expand it? I mean, I'm from the franchising background. How, well, how do you feel about franchising? <clears throat> Thank you. you. Want me to take that one? Yeah, I think <laughs> yeah uh, actually, I'll give you an example from the uh, McDonald's world. Thailand, for example, is uh, actually uh, run not by a McDonald's uh, uh, leadership team. It's actually run by a local company local Thai company that is uh, called a uh, distribution licensee and they sit at the pyramid, if you will, for all the other 250 stores that are currently in Thailand today for McDonald's and plan for, I think, 20-30% growth from, for the foreseeable future on that number. So uh, one of the tensions to find the right platform for growth uh, from McDonald's, which arguably is one of the larger franchises in the world, is to figure out when they control it centrally, or when they work with a very capable partner. McDonald's just opened, uh, well, it's, they haven't opened yet, but they've selected uh, a, a local entrepreneur in Vietnam, and Vietnam will be the 38th country in Asia Pacific, Middle East, and Africa to open uh, it, around the first of the year. And uh, they chose a uh, very entrepreneurial, uh, actually comes from investment banking background, 
but with a real passion for the business. And you know, I've been spending the last couple of years in China uh, with McDonald's and with Subway, and I, I find that the franchisees and the, the distribution licensees that they're choosing to give entire provinces to, so Yunnan province, for example, again, a mix of entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit, passion for the business, and also, at least for the, for the distribution licensees, very deep pockets. We're talking about you know, 30, 35 year type relationships, uh, multi tens of millions of dollars for an entire province in China. Uh, franchisees, I think the typical uh, you know, store or cluster of stores is much smaller than that. But the, at least for McDonald's, there's a very clear organization around what the customer experience is. And whether you're in uh, Phuket or Bali Pakpan, as I mentioned before, or, or, or anywhere else in the big core cities, you, you know, the, the promise of full menu 24 hours a day, if it's that kind of place, and that you're eating safe food in an environment, you know, in, in a lot of you know, peripheral cities which may not have a lot of safe food, um, that's their promise, and that's you know that's where they're building a lot of their uh, uh, brand equity and a, and a lot of their sales. Um, so if you've got a passion for that and you've got some money, then uh, there's I think you can just Google that website McDonald's franchisee <laughs> and you'll be able to be able to hook yourself in there. Sorry. Short answer for that. I think it depends on the strategy. Um, typically, we see the brand owner when they go to a, a foreign countries. If, they, if the corporate strategy is to grow, then they will typically take very strong local distributors and give franchisee to them. And if the, if the brand owner feel the integrity of the brand is more important than the, the speed of the growth, they will have their own uh, a retail store and grow slowly. So I think it's very much depend on the strategy of the company stands for. Thanks, Lucy. And next question. I'm the mic runner. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Uh, Sundi Ayer, supply chain consultant. Um, my question is around collaboration. Um, uh, you, you all talked about the importance of partnerships and collaboration. Uh, and Lucy, I'll pick up on your comment. You talked about uh, really sharing, gain sharing, you know, with continuous improvement. And, and I, I'll offer a slightly different angle, and that is continuous innovation. And I think that ties to our innovation topic of the, uh, of the session also. Maybe if you, could tell, if you could just share perspectives on how do you continuously innovate? And Dhawal, you mentioned the, the building of capabilities and capacities in your suppliers, right? And, and then try, I think in the 3PL industry, we talk about continuous, innova continuous improvement all the time. But what does continuous innovation mean to the three, all four of us uh, as a next frontier in supply chain excellence? Thanks. Can I go? Um, yeah, so I think it's a very important leg uh, of collaboration. Uh, certainly where we sit, I think a lot of the technologies that, that get deployed, whether they're in packaging or whether they're in formulation technology, uh, lie with our suppliers. And a lot of our, 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 our suppliers are global corporations in their own right, uh, with huge amounts of capability and, huge, and, and a very, very huge geographic presence, usually global. Um, and we work as true partners then. But that relationship has to be developed in a long-term way, as I think as, as Troy and others have said. Uh, the edge on money will always be there, let's be frank. But that discussion is a different discussion from a partnership discussion. Because I think those are two sets of players. And the way to do this is to develop a multi-level uh, relationship in an organization. If the relationship is buyer to seller, that's only a unidimensional relationship. And frankly, if, you, if that's the tenuous nature of the relationship between two partners, frankly, uh, it's not going very far. But when you have an almost a, a top to top uh, and at every level, several levels of relationships, that's when you start developing yourself as a true long-term partner. The tensions will exist. The interesting thing is to live with those tensions and move forward. Yeah, and I think while these all sound motherhoods, but the reality is I could give you 20 examples, uh, I guess, offline, where these work and 20 where they don't work, honestly. Yeah, you know, we, we, uh, we work with McDonald's and we don't have a contract anywhere. Think about that. Uh, that's how deep that kind of relationship goes. Um, and we sit, actually tonight, as I told Paul, I got a flight to Japan, and we sit on a, a logistics council with our nearest competitor, who does Australia and New Zealand. And we have to share every year 
our most innovative application, I mean the real execution stuff, the real stuff, not uh, you know, a new WMS or something like that. How do we actually you know, keep food safe somewhere in a funny place? Or how did we really uh, you know, introduce a tool that led to significant efficiency gains? And we have to share that with our competitor. And I think that's the kind of spirit, that's the level you got to get to when you, when you find true collaboration and how you're going to win in supply chains because brand owners and a couple of partners can't do it on their own. It's got to be a whole, if you don't leverage whatever your entire system has to bring to bear for innovation, because somebody's got it out there. Somebody's created lots of wheels out there. You want to bring that into an area that it can be shared. And I think it's a good theme, uh, you know, the sharing of best practice, sharing of innovation. Uh, a lot of the critical let's say, uh, disruptive changes that are going on to find that growth and actually execute and, and capture it every day in, in emerging and fast-growing Asia. These things that are being learned and uh, being brought up to board levels and shared, they're going to go into developed markets all of a sudden and become a tool or a technique or business process that is, you're going to see cropping up in North America or Europe. Uh, it, it happens a lot in our industry where, for example, uh, to take advantage uh, uh, or to, to go around the highest rents in some of the peripheral markets, which are way, way higher than even in, in some of the core cities, and, and just finding appropriate space uh, is very difficult. The, they, you're saying that the, 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 the new small is vertical. So rather than having a big store footprint, you, you innovate by just thinking differently, and you go with multiple levels, or you put all of the non-customer facing uh, process in a, in a, in a restaurant you put it in the basement and you bring processed food or uh, 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 anything else up through conveyors to a, a serving center. These kind of things may not sound like a big deal, but do them on a mass scale, thousands of restaurants, multiple thousands of restaurants over the next 10 years, that's going to be the difference in share prices for many, many companies. And that's real innovation. It starts with the collaboration. Craig, I'm going to jump in. Uh, as I said, though, if we go on, we always don't have time because you look at, uh, you count the amount of years they spent, I think it's about a decade. So who's the oldest? I don't know. <laughs> I know a decade, a century. I'm so sorry. A century. 25, 25, 25, 25, right? So there's so much knowledge. Huh? No, then I'm, then I'm six. <laughs> uh, the, there's too much. So you can't go on. And the whole idea is to, to tease you guys that they have a lot more. You can approach them. And that's where the 6 p.m. will start, okay? But I think our drunken mode, we can't ask proper questions, right? Okay, anyway, thank you. Can we thank the panelists? <laughs>